I must say, uh, all the introductions that I have ever received, I must say that, Greg, that was by far the most recent. <laughs> and also the shortest as well. And you guys heard from uh, Greg, Executive uh, VP of IDC World Source. You know, great guy, and he was mentioning two weeks ago, we had the uh, VP East Conference in Collingwood. And Greg sends me an urgent text message. He goes, you know, Alex, you're a funny guy. Send me some jokes that I can use to kick off the meeting. I said, well, Greg, I'm really busy at the office right now. Can I send them to you later today? He goes, man, that's really funny. Can, <laughs> can you send me some more? Anyways, Greg's a great guy. Uh, Greg mentioned um, the CE. And I hope, even though I'm the first speaker, I hope you can all stay to the end of the day because we have, where's Jazz Gill? The, the CE police, Jazz is actually gonna be taking attendance. And you don't wanna get on Jazz's bad side because if you do, just ask Dean Erickson in the back there from Equitable Life what it's like to be on Jazz's bad side. <laughs> Anyways, great to be here, uh, great resort, great hotel, and those of you that were at Sparkling Hill last year for our VP conference, I always like to tell a funny story about the hotels that we stay at, and of course, last year, I'm not going to repeat that joke, but it was about, uh, you know, I had a leak in my sink, and um, I, I kept on saying, you know, I. I got a leak in my sink, but I, I meant got a leak, not got to leak in my sink. <laughs> but anyways, it was, a, it was a funny story. But I was thinking about, you know, what's really funny about uh, hotels, a lot of us guys that, and men, dudes, when we travel, oftentimes for business, conferences, or work, we're traveling, you know, by ourselves. So after about the first day, we, we realized, oh man, this is great. You know, we can leave the AC on, the windows open, leave the heat on, right? Throw our clothes all over the place, throw our towels all, all over the place, and you know, it, it doesn't matter. But one really bad habit that us guys pick up when we're staying by ourselves in a hotel, we forget to put the toilet seat up, right? So, you know, you, you, you get home, you bring your bad habits with you, and then you hear your spouse scream in the middle of the night, oh my goodness, you left the toilet seat up. <laughs> Anyways, so let's get going. <laughs> That's why they put me up first, tell you a few jokes. And so my talk today, succession planning uh, for the financial advisor. How do I sell my business and, and, and what is it worth? And I think it's really relevant to everybody in our business today. Whether you be a new advisor or a seasoned advisor, at some point in your career, you know, you're going to sell uh, your, your book of uh, business. But before I get into talking about advisor succession planning, a couple of weeks ago, my good friend Vic Ray, who's our National Director of Banking, part of our Banking and Wealth team, we have Graham Allen in the East, and of course led by uh, Jason Payne out of Halifax, the head of uh, Banking and Wealth. But Vic said to me, you know Alex, do you know what our advisors are fishing for out there? And Vic said, you know, we really got to help them to position themselves and fish better for new clients. Because until you all make a sale and commissions are paid, nothing happens. Nobody gets paid, including us. So I thought about that and many of you know I'm quite the avid salmon fisherman. And we've been going to Nootka Island Lodge for over 25 years. A few of you in the audience has been uh, Brad, Norman, Brian, Drake as well, right? And I kind of thought about it and I thought, you know, fishing for clients or fishing for new prospects 
is very similar to the process for salmon fishing, especially for, for large Chinooks like you see here. We don't just get onto the boat, go out anywhere, drop our lines and hope that we catch salmon. There's a lot of preparation, even preparation the night before. And some of you that have fished with me, you've heard me say this. Okay, do we eat salmon at dinner? Because there's salmon served, fresh salmon, every night the dinner before. And we think, you know, if you eat the salmon, this is dead salmon. And salmon have a keen sense of smell and all that stuff. And you're going out in the waters and they can smell their dead cousins on your body because you, you, you ate them. So it's things like that. And we also think, okay, what time are we going to get up? It's usually 4.30. And even when we, we get up, where do we go? Like, if you've been to the, you know, the Nootka, Nootka Island waters areas, it, it's massive, right? There's, there's, there's millions of uh, acres of terrain where you can uh, fish. So you got to plan the night before. So you also have to plan on, okay, what time we're going to go out? You know, what are we going to use to fish with? Are we going to use a flasher? Are we going to use a spoon, a hoochie, live bait? And when we do drop our lines, what depth are we going to put the lines at? And also, what speed are we going to troll at? So again, there's a lot of planning uh, put into that. And I think there's similar planning when you're out there uh, prospecting uh, for new uh, clients. The other, the advisor uh, in the pictures here, that's uh, Lau McDougall, one of our president's uh, conference advisors. He operates Strata Wealth in Western Canada. Uh, his partner is uh, Tyler Birch out of the Muskokas, great friend of uh, Greg Osmack. So the, the fish on the right there, that was the trophy winner for this year, uh, 25.6 pounds. And with all the planning, I've been fishing with Lao for seven years, and with all the planning that we, we do, we were actually able to bring up 19 Chinooks of this size. You're only allowed to keep four each, but because of the planning and I guess the execution and everything, we're able to catch a lot of fish. And for an advisor, when you're out there prospecting or fishing for new clients, like when we put, do all the planning, we drop our lines, put the bait in the water, you will get a bite within 30 seconds if it's done properly. And for yourselves as advisors, when you're out there at a party or a social function and you need, meet new people, you actually have 30 seconds to make a great impression. So my question to all of you is, can you describe to me your business plan and target market and what you're fishing for out there and what is your process? And have you perfected your, I call it the 30 second elevator commercial or introductory line at a party? Uh, the fellow that I fish with, my good friend Lyle McDougal, here is his. My name is Lyle McDougal, certified financial planner and best-selling author in financial literacy and navigating wealth. I work with small business owners by reallocating tax efficiently a portion of corporate surplus and diversify into cash value life insurance that creates wealth along with family and estate protection. That is his 30 second elevator speech and that's one of the reasons why he's a very successful advisor and no doubt within a few years he'll be earning a seven figure uh, income. And also in our industry each and every one of you can get published and write a book. Uh, Lau has written two books. I have a few copies of his latest books uh, here today that I'm going to give out. And he is today an Amazon uh, bestseller. Believe it or not, it doesn't take a lot to be an Amazon uh, bestseller. <laughs> 
so his first book, uh, Those Who Fail to Plan, Plan to Fail. And his most recent book is Enlightened uh, Prosperity. And I've got a few copies of his books here, but you don't get something for nothing. I'm gonna call upon the audience. How come some people are hiding? Brian Brotherston, stand up and give me your 30 second elevator speech. Uh, my name is Brian Brotherston. I'm a qualified associate financial planner. I work with mass affluent clients in all walks of life to assist in developing a meaningful financial plan to save for retirement, to reduce taxes and debt, and to fund unforeseen circumstances like premature death and disability. When was the last time that you had a complimentary second opinion on your financial plan? Awesome. Oh. Yeah. There you go, Brian. Anybody else? Everybody's shy. I'm going to pick on someone later. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. I have three more books here. Come up to me anytime at the break, lunch. Give me your 30 second elevator speech, and I'll grab a book for you. So here we go. I'm going to pause for a quick story when it comes to advisor buy sell. And I've been talking for years, it's got to be a, a good fit. And this is something that I wrote probably a while ago uh, for seller and buyer. Uh, the two must share common strands from the same core DNA of character. An inherent desire to do what's right for the client, a strong commitment to client service, and to add value with proven and effective advice, a passion for wealth, life insurance, and complete financial risk and retirement and estate planning. So there's got to be a good fit. And oftentimes advisors come up to me and say, oh, Alex, what are the multiples going for you know, on a book of business today? I said, well, it depends. It can go from very low to very high. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Because I found in my experience, over the years I've done well over 25 uh, um, book valuations, many of them resulting uh, in, in a buy-sell. And again, I just always tell advisors, you got to do your due diligence. And I've come up with 13 points of due diligence that I'm going to share with you uh, today. So life insurance and insurance wealth advisor um, block value considerations. It's funny, when I told uh, Greg and Don I was going to do this presentation, and they said, well, Alex, you're, you're the wealth leader. You know, what does talking about business succession planning for financial advisors and how to, how to value and how to sell your book of business have to do with the wealth business that I, I represent? Well, again, from the last 25 book valuations that I've done, and again, many of them resulting in a buy-sell. Time and time again, the wealth or seg fund trailers account for over 85% of the value of the block of business. And many of you have heard me say over the years, try to balance the revenues in your book of business, 50% life insurance, 50% uh, seg funds. And if you can structure your seg funds with a front end zero, get that higher trailer from day one, and of course sell more life insurance for the immediate revenue stream, and you will then build a higher long-term value in your book. So again, my goal is to have advisors you know, market more segregated funds, 
GICs, GIAs, and annuities to build the value in your book of business. And don't forget, we do have win succession. It's a still a great option for many of you, uh, whether you signed a binding or non-binding uh, letter of understanding. You know, so again, we call it a free insurance policy. However, if you have a junior advisor you're working with, or, the, or mentoring, or you have an IDC World Source colleague that you have started talks with, that may be something that's preferable, and then you will know actually who is buying your book of business and who is going to be servicing all your clients that you've worked so hard to build up. And when conducting a business valuation, there's so many factors that come into play on how to value the book of business. That's why it, it always kills me when advisors ask me, well, Alex, what does a book of business go for? I said, well, it depends. You know, that's such a general question. It's almost like asking me, oh, how much, how much does a house go for? Well, it all depends on so many factors. So I've kind of narrowed it down to 13 <coughs> general categories that I'll discuss today, and then I'm going to go over the 10 steps on how to do the transaction. So on your tables in front of you, I think some of you thought, thought we were going to play bingo, right Jazz? Yes. So there's papers there. I want everyone to grab one. They're numbered 1 to 13. And we're going to go back to school, whether it be university or high school, and you're going to rate your own book of business, whether you have one client or a thousand clients, it doesn't matter. For each of the 13 categories I talk about, I want you to rate it A, which is excellent, D, you know, failure, C minus, you know, well below average, C plus, kind of average, B, above average. So when you buy or sell a book of business, like any business, you can either do an asset or a share sale. Now of course with a share sale, you're qualified for the small business corporation shares uh, lifetime capital gains exemption. I refer to it as the jumbo exemption. It is now $971,190. If you want to know more about this, ask Brad Hyde. He's an expert on working with this. And a share sale is advantageous to the seller because they can use the jumbo exception and have potential tax savings. But sometimes though, the seller, they still want to retain the corporation because they may have lots of retained earnings in there. Maybe they've been doing some shareholder loans for tax planning. Probably they have their own life insurance uh, in the corporation. And also, the corporation can also receive the buyout over time to minimize and shelter the cash until it's needed. So sometimes, even though it starts out as a potential uh, share sale, it's switched to an asset sale because the seller wants to do it over time. So here, how you rate your own book of business is, if you sell your business, are you adamant that you want to sell the shares or are you okay to sell just the assets? If you have flexibility, you're going to attract potentially more qualified purchasers. And of course, if you're not incorporated, uh, it will be an asset sale. You know, advisors ask us all the time, you know, when you should incorporate your book of business. Well, for sure, once you get to the VP level, you should look at incorporating your practice. You know, you look at advisors at our president's conference, you know, they're usually all in incorporated. Uh, asset sales, again, they're easier, they're cleaner. And you don't have to deal with other shareholders. You know, in, in our business, when an advisor is incorporated, sometimes their wife owns shares. Sometimes their kids do, right? So when you're buying the shares, you have to deal with every, everybody. And also, when you're, you're buying the shares in the company, you also get what I call the skeletons in the closet, right? You're buying everything. You're getting the whole company, everything that's within it. 
And sometimes when you know it doesn't work out as a share sale and it turns into an asset sale, we'll just gross up the value a little bit to pay for the taxes. And usually, you know, most if not all advisors in our industry, they only want the assets. Okay? And what are the assets? The assets are, of course, the clients, but they're buying the reoccurring revenues, you know, the seg fund trailers or the life insurance uh, renewals. Thus, asset sales are the most common. I talk a lot about demographic and geographic breakdown. You know, the wealth book, is it primarily mature clients that are starting to redeem? They're starting to gift away their money. Uh, they're, you know, riffing, riffing out all their money so that block is uh, depleting. Or they want to give their money away now, you know, to charities, their church, or other philanthropic um, uh, uses. So sometimes that can be an issue. But I say not necessarily and not always, because oftentimes the older clients, they have valuable real estate that they're going to be selling. Or they have businesses that they'll be selling as well. And these clients will have need for estate planning, utilizing permanent life insurance, and of course, segregated funds. Okay? And again, a lot of these older clients that are maybe riffing out, they still might have a lot of life insurance um, on the books. And will these death benefit payouts uh, be in reinvested by the spouse or beneficiaries? And I'm going to talk a little bit about having a multi-generational practice because that adds a lot of value to your book of business. So demographics it needs to be researched in depth. And is the demographics of the book of business that you're wanting to buy or selling to another advisor, are they similar to what you're doing or are they worlds apart? And that makes a big difference. Uh, geographic location of the clients, are they within a city, within 100K of, so you don't have to drive all over the place? Or are they spread over all of Western Canada? And also where are the uh, seller and buyer located? And it's funny, the first night at dinner, uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Frizen was talking to a bunch of people and he says, yeah, I came on here to Alberta, I went on my milk run, right? And a younger advisor didn't know what a milk run was. In our business, a milk run is basically driving all over the place, deliver not delivering milk, but seeing your clients and all that stuff. I knew an advisor, he was based out of Vernon. Every quarter in the year, he would pack up his truck and trailer. He would drive all across Western Canada, all the way to Thunder Bay to service his clients. And he did this four times a year and he was gone for six weeks. Now can you imagine if you were the advisor buying his book of business and you were not prepared to do that? You know, it would, yeah, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a good, good story. So again, concentrated geography will have greater value. So when you're doing that little bingo sheet there, if your clients are concentrated and geographically and you sell them one day, it will have greater value. Multi-generational. I was at a Manulife Wealth Conference last week. And one of the speakers was uh, uh, Dr. Dan Deans, who uh, Manulife really promotes. Great guy, great author, very successful uh, business person. And he talks about having meetings, joint meetings with advisors and their clients. And sometimes they're multi-generational, not two, not even three, sometimes four generations. And can you imagine if you have four generations of a family in your book of business. You know, those clients, you know, aren't going anywhere. So multi-generational is, you know, really important. You know, and I just talked about it, you know, here. If the block has older clients, you know, are the children, the grandchildren, you know, are they uh, clients? And of course, a lot more value when this money can pass to beneficiaries that are already your uh, clients. Because, if the beneficiaries are not your clients, when your clients do pass away, the seg funds, the life insurance payout, you know, goes to the beneficiaries, 
you know, that money is off your books, right? So again, when, one of the great things to do every couple years, just reach out to your clients and review the beneficiaries, you know? And do, do the beneficiaries know what mom or dad, grandma, grandpa has? And ask them, is it okay if I reach out uh, you know, to your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, and let them know the plan that we've put together. So again, it's a great way to, you know, solidify your business and to make new sales. So again, multi-generational, as you assess your practice, the more, the better as well. You know, ethnic and cultural, you, know, you look around the room, and here in Canada, you know, like we're, we're so blessed to have people from all walks of life, all countries, multi-ethnic, different cultures, and it's really great. However, if you sell your book of business to perhaps someone outside of your community, it could be just a simple thing as a language barrier. You can't speak the same language, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. And again, just the different nuances that you get with different cultural backgrounds. Like, so if you're not familiar with those nuances in the different ethnic groups, then perhaps, you know, the buy-sell is not a good thing to do. And also comfort level, especially some of the clients from, you know, from, from the old country. You know, you know they, they feel more comfortable, they have a, more of a sense of harmony or a sense of, you know, commonality when they know that the new advisor is very similar, similar ethnic, cultural background as the selling advisor. So again, in these situations, you know, if your book of business is very concentrated in a very ethnic or cultural market, you know, try to sell to someone within your same community. If you're looking at more of, of the broad market, a more diversified uh, practice, ethnic and cultural, well then perhaps demand or fetch a greater multiple. And again, you know, the purchase price, it may be reduced if the purchaser is perhaps from outside of your cultural background. And I know religion is always a hot topic. I mean, there's wars for, for, for generations over it. But sometimes, you know, if, if this is a topic that is okay to discuss, you know, sometimes it's okay to, to talk to the selling advisor on this because sometimes if there's a clash in religious beliefs and religious beliefs of, of the clients, it may not be a, a good fit. So business lines uh, penetration. Like in a perfect world, uh, uh, every client in, a, in an advisor's book of business will have everything, right? They'll have life and health insurance. They'll have DI, CI, long-term care, seg funds. You know, they'd be full of banking referrals. You know, they'll be your group clients, etc. But we know that's not always the case. So if you were buying an advisor's book of business and, and they said to you, you know, Sam, I've sold my clients everything, everything, life insurance, DICI, seg funds, banking referrals, everything. There's nothing more to sell them. Well, if there's nothing more to sell them, then of course there's less value um, in that book of business, even though they would be super sticky. So we have actually great success with wealth advisors purchasing a life-only block, right? So then you can talk to all those clients about seg funds, annuities, GIAs, etc. And we have also great success in life advisors purchasing a wealth block, especially if that wealth block is perhaps transitioned from a stockbroker to, you know, then he, he or she became mutual fund licensed and then transferred the book to seg funds. They probably sold, you know, you can count the life insurance policies on one hand. So there's great opportunities for life advisors purchasing a wealth block to, again, market life insurance strategies and concepts to them. And also individual life and health advisors buying a small group practice. Uh, you hear from uh, David or Candy uh, later, why not buy that small group practice, 
sent all that business to, to David uh, you know, and, and his team and focus on the one-to-one -one planning with the business owners, the executives, and all the plan members. So again, lots of opportunities there. So again, we need to assess the client base for future sales opportunities you know, towards the different uh, business lines that we do represent. So here, if there's less products for each client on the books, it will have more value because then there's more value to the purchasing advisor. So life company spread. You know, back in the day when Paul Brown started his uh, MGA IBG, there was probably 150 something, you know, life insurance companies. But of course, that's still narrowed. But what I found over the years, some advisor, f for whatever reason, their book of business is spread over up to 25 life insurance companies. Like who here in this room would like to buy an advisor's book of business and need to know 25 different life insurance companies, products, systems, underwriting, and all that stuff, right? That's, that's not an ideal situation. However, who would prefer to buy a book of business that has one core carrier and perhaps two or three for specialty products? You know, could, this could be on the life side, on the seg fund side. So these concentrated books, you know, I find have greater value. Especially if it's a company that you're familiar and friendly with. I just use an example, you know, if a Manulife friendly advisor is purchasing another block of business that's heavy in Manulife products, you know, that would be a really good fit and easy, you know, tran transition there. And you can put any of the life insurance companies we have in there in replace for, for Manulife. So sometimes, you know, if Sun Life is your favorite company or Canada Life or any of the insurance companies, you know, maybe seek out an advisor that is also, you know, very familiar or friendly to that company. Because gone are the days when advisors bought books of business and they replaced everything or they, they turned the seg fund block you know, into the companies that they like and they represent. First of all, that's not to the client's best interest to do that ever. And of course, you know, compliance today would frown upon you know, just replacing and churning just because you know, you're not familiar with that company. So again, you know, the, the focus really is to, to purchase the book of business and service and grow the block, not necessarily replace or churn any of the investments. Uh, seller exit time frame. This is quite important in advisor buy-sell. So will the seller stay on for three months, six months, a year or longer? If the selling advisor is gonna stay on longer, that will definitely add more value in that book of business. And you can ask yourself that question as well when you rate yourself here. Are you willing to stay on and transition over time? Because if, I've seen this before, if the seller says, you know what, I'm selling, right? Andrew's selling and you know, I'm moving to Mexico. Well, guess what? Your clients will now think, well, Andrew's gone, yeah, it's about time I start to interview other advisors, right? So the seller exit time frame, you know, is very important. And as I said here, the transition over time, because, you know, John or Jane or Andrew is still there, and this will enhance the value uh, of the book of business. And again, sometimes, you know, selling your book of business and staying involved in, over time, you know, over a couple years, you know, it could ease the tax burden on you because then, you know, you can accept the payment over a few tax years. And again, over time, will also, you know, ease the cash needs of the buyer, right? Because the buyer has to come up with the deposit and also pay for that book of business. So if you're willing to transition over time, 
you know, you can almost use the cash flow that's generated from the book of business, you know, to buy out the book of business that you are buying. So transition over time, you know, works quite well. You know, and, and if you're willing to do that, you can also ask for a higher multiple. And it's also easier on the buyer. Uh, business overhead expenses. When you're buying a book of business, like what are the built-in uh, business overhead expenses? Are there, you know, leases on the premise or, or a mortgage, uh, equipment leases, you know, auto leases, etc. that may be part of uh, the deal? You know, are there employees that you have to assume, you know? Many advisors have assistants. You know, are they going to stay on? You know, after the acquisition, are you going to bring them on staff? So it's something to consider when you're buying a book of business to see, you know, what are the business overhead uh, expenses involved uh, in, in that business. And is there any duplication of staff? Right? Uh, and again, asset purchase is ideal if the existing business overhead expenses are not required. Financial statements, you know, look for well-prepared and audited financial statements by an accounting firm, not by John Smith, the accountant next door. And are personal and corporate taxes up to date? Many of you heard me say over the years in our business, beware of CRA. There's actually two things I used to talk about, beware of CRA, and also beware of jumbo cases, because we've seen jumbo cases go off the books and a challenge for advisors to pay back. But I've added a third one now, because Eric is here, uh, compliance as well, right? So CRA, jumbo cases, compliance, always be wary of those. The more detailed and clear the financials are, there's gonna be more value in the business, if an advisor says to you, well, I'll get the financials to you as soon as possible because I'm two years behind, right? You know, that, that might be a bit of a warning. So here we come to compliance. Are there any past compliance concerns? Today, you can Google any advisor. You know, you can Google any advisor out there. If there's any compliance issues, insurance counsels, securities, etc., their name will come up. You know, an isolated occurrence may be okay, depending on the circumstances. You know, any more than that, and if they're on Eric Watchtail's speed dial, then, you know, beware. You know, if there are multiple compliance issues, you know, and especially if they're from another MGA and we don't know their business that well, you know, just, just tread carefully. Uh, documented compliance files, appointment of a chief compliance officer, you know, with the compliance books, the cl compliance manual that Eric talks about all the time. You know, is the manual updated? You know, are there reviews uh, placed in there? And, and are they signed off on every year? So compliance is really important. Squeaky clean compliance here adds a lot more value to the business. So when you look at number 11, how do you rate your business when it comes to compliance? Paper or digital is huge today. You know, we've seen situations kind of laugh at this, you know. You know, you're saying, the selling advisor says, well, when should the five-ton truck come to your office and bring you the eight four-drawer filing cabinets, right? You know, Greg's laughing and others are laughing because we've seen this before. We're in advisor's practice is all in these big bank of filing cabinets, you know, and paper files, right? Or would you prefer that all the client files are in a great CRM, encrypted, backed up, you know, hard drive for every single client, every single document, full compliance history, you know, meeting notes, web meeting notes, phone call notes, you know, and also, you know, look for our CRM system. Today, most systems are compatible. They can be merged, but then again, hopefully the system is compatible uh, with yours. Uh, their media presence, you know, you know, a great website, social media, because when you you sell or buy, when you're buying an advisor's uh, practice, you know, all this 
you know, uh, digital flow can go to your social media site or to your uh, website. So it goes without saying, you know, a well-organized uh, digital uh, practice with great, you know, information and great potential for, you know, future sales because of the tracking of all the client data will have superior value. And last but not least, and I'm going to quickly go through the 10 steps here. Uh, what is the reputation, uh, goodwill, and business style of the selling advisor? So is the selling advisor, you know, what is his or her reputation or the company's reputation? You know, do they have professional uh, designations? Uh, are there references from the MGA, whether it be ours or from uh, another? You know, and again, are the markets that the buyer and seller work in, are they similar or are they vastly uh, different? Okay. What is the style of practice? Is it planning focused or is it specialty product emphasized? So again, you know, you know it's got to be a good fit. And again, persistency. You know, if you're buying a book of business that has less than a 90% persistency ratio, again, you know, you, you got to find out, you know, why. So again, better persistency is always much better. Uh, seg fund blocks, you know, today with the chargeback schedules, some of the schedules going five years, you know, if you're buying a book of business that still has a lot of chargeback on it and those clients redeem, you have to pay it back, right? Because you're the current owner of that block of business. Life insurance as well, you know, it, are, is there any uh, exposure still to the commissions that have been uh, paid, right? Because there's a 24 month chargeback period. So again, that all comes in assessing the book of business that you're buying. So back to my earlier comment, you know, is the seg fund block, you know, DSC, chargeback, or primarily front end zero? Or perhaps chargeback where, and DSC that has expired. And of course, less exposure to any chargeback, life or seg fund will yield more value. And generally, our business does not have goodwill like some business do. And in some cases, especially mature blocks of business, you know, the life renewals have run out. So we just apply a, a $10 value to these policies for potential future opportunity. So now, what is the number? So once you've assessed each and every one of these 13 areas of due diligence, it's kind of like an investor profile, because I'm the wealth guy, so this is an investor profile. You score yourself out of 65, you grade each of the 13 uh, areas um, of due diligence, grade them from an A down to a D, with A being five points, B four points, C plus three points, C minus two, and a D one, right? And if you score 60 to 65, or the book of business scores that, you can ask 3.75 to five times, which is the very high end. If you score, or we score a book of business 52 to 60, it will be three to three and three quarters. 39 to 51, 2.5 to three, which is average. And then 26 to 38, below average. Any less than that, one times, maybe one and a half, one and three quarters, or just pass on that book of business. So again, after you've done all the due diligence, then you can talk to me and I can help you do the, do the multiple. And again, this is just a general guideline. Right? And I kind of refer to a mature advisor selling his or her book of business. It's also almost like selling the family home. You know, you've lived there all your life. Your kids grew up there. Your parents lived there. Your grandparents lived there. So you get really emotional. So I always say to advisors, like, don't get emotional. And it's, and again, it's like buying and selling anything. Right? The seller always wants to get 
maximum price and the buyer always wants to get a good deal right and don't be discouraged you know don't get upset if the seller is here and you think it's worth here you know it's it's okay so the first step is to identify an advisor with a similar business style and start casual conversations. And the good thing is they do not have to be with IDC WorldSource. You know, our company executive, Paul, Greg, Phil, and others, they've realized that, you know, acquiring books of business from another MGA is actually really good for us as well. So as you're out there in your travels, you meet an advisor, and the advisor says, you know what, I've been thinking of selling my business, but I'm with, you know, PPI, FM, the hub, or whoever, it's okay. Still come and talk to us, because we can help you through that. And again, review the many points, the 13 points of due diligence, you know, spend the time, don't just rush into it, reach out to me, you know, through, through Jazz and her team, or Ronnie, or, or Greg, or Paul, or, or anybody, reach out. Uh, review the compensation statements. You know, I was in situations where an advisor and their accountants were dissecting a book of business, trying to find out, you know, what the renewals were, and they were spending a fortune in time. And I said to them, why don't you just look at the year-end statements? Well, what do you mean? Look at the year-end statements, December 31st statements. On every insurance company, there's a line. It says, renewal commissions. That's it. Get two or three years worth of that, and we have the life renewals. Seg fund renewals are at my fingertips, so it's very easy to get. So we draft a letter of intent, you know, enter into a confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement, you know, draft the buy-sell agreement, you know, for the share sales, you need to get legal advice, but if it's an asset sale, you know, I can help you with that as well. Uh, obtain financing or set up a HELOC in advance. We hope to have advisor book financing in the future, right, Greg? Right, Paul? And I know it's something that, you know, we're, we're working on. And again, you complete the absolute assignments with your buy-sell. Every insurance company that there's business on the books uh, will transfer. The buy-sell is completed, and the trailers the, and the renewals will start you know, being paid to yourselves as the new advisors if you're buying. And here's where you do the letters of introductions, the email notices, you know, face-to-face -face meetings with the top clients, you know, um, web meetings for maybe some of the other clients that you can't meet face-to-face -face with. And time and time again, there's going to be stuff that falls through the cracks. We do a sweep up after six months and 12 months. It's very easy to do. Just check the selling advisor's corporate bank account. You know, you see a few dollars going here and there from RBC Insurance you know, Sun Life or wherever, you know that there were clients that were missed. And we'll help you through uh, all of that. Anyways, I know I'm just about out of time. Perhaps maybe come to me at the break or at lunch if you do have any questions. You know, and again, I found the vast majority of buyers and sellers are, you know, extremely happy. <laughs> so thank you everybody for your time this morning.